Life is beautiful, you are beautiful, life is beautiful, we are beautiful too. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Daniel Carcillo journey and extremely excited and thankful and grateful that he's uh, taken the time to be able to speak to me. And we have the head of the Center for Psychedelic Research, Robin Carhart Harris, uh, from the Imperial College of London with us to speak about plant medicines and also psychedelics and the really amazing research that they are doing at the Imperial College of London. So Robin, thank you very much for being here. Very happy to be here, Daniel. Nice. So where I wanted to start was what, what really intrigues me and I think what um, may intrigue my followers is, is finding out how somebody comes about focusing their life's work on the brain. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and about you and, and how you came about to uh, be in the position that you're in today? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I guess it started as, you know, a teenager, uh, curious about things <laughs> in a very general sense. And maybe slightly intentionally vague sense and, and experimenting with things here and there, uh, becoming interested in psychedelics, uh, uh, them having a big effect on my thinking. Um, and then um, really probably because of that and because of my age, um, getting drawn into psychology, studying psychology as, as, a, as a young student, uh, eventually doing a degree in psychology and then a master's in uh, what they call depth psychology. So that's psychology that recognizes the existence of the unconscious mind, classically associated with psychoanalysis, Freud, Carl Jung, that kind of thing. And I love that side of psychology and, and that really, you know, really woke up uh, in a sense the the field for me woke up psychology and brought it to life and made it really, really interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and then um, what I didn't expect to find and I stumbled across was the old work done in the 50s and 60s with LSD and depth psychotherapy, where the principle was that psychedelics like LSD the the like really the main thing they do and probably the reason why they're called psychedelic mind revealing is that they facilitate access to the unconscious mind conscious access to the unconscious mind or you know perforate that filter between normal consciousness and what's not conscious um and that just blew my mind um uh, and made so much sense, made sense of experiences in the past for me, started to put a bit of meat on the bone of depth psychology, which for so long had felt like almost like a philosophy or a study of art uh, to me, uh, meaning not particularly scientific. And then to realize that people had found drugs that you know, almost provide, as Stan Groff said, and it was Stan Groff's work that brought me into this space, uh, laboratory proof for basic theories, basic hypotheses of, of depth psychology or psychoanalysis, uh, LSD doing that, you know, for me, that was like, well, that's a real, like, hammer down on on a hard surface <laughs> like this is concrete now and then i was like well this is fun this is something to do <laughs> to give my life meaning and uh, i just immersed myself and i've been immersed ever since and and i'm almost 40 now and i was about 24 at the time that i discovered stan groff's work you know maybe 10 years is shock a few people maybe after <laughs> becoming initially interested in psychedelics let's say and uh and then uh you know all the pieces came together and and it's been um you know an obsession ever since i'm sure many people can empathize with that kind of obsession but you asked about the brain i mean why the brain um i don't know i think it's probably the way i've been brought up and and different experiences but for me, um, just talking about the psychology and as fascinating as it is and the phenomenology, the lived experience, 
Um, I again that principle of wanting to be concrete and put some meat on the bone, uh, in a sense, sort of literally. I I thought well, a sitting duck is here is like what the hell is happening in our brains when we're tripping on psychedelics, and um, and to know that or to make a start in getting to address that question is going to have you know further implications and be a even bigger kind of hammer blow onto the hard surface for the science of depth psychology. Almost saying like you know this is how systems in the mind and brain work this is like kind of you know dynamically speaking this is the biological flip side of the unconscious mind or this is the biological flip side of the ego and for me that felt like the kind of obvious place to to go if i could go there and then i kind of lucky breaks that enabled me to to go there yeah Nice. And so I think for a lot of my following, it might be somewhat relatively new, uh, some of these terms. Uh, when you talk about uh, Freud and, and ego, uh, I've heard a lot, obviously, of your talks talking about ego dissolution, consciousness, the conscious mind, the unconscious mind. Would you be able to break down a few of those terms um, so that the layperson uh, might be able to connect to some of the things that we'll be speaking about? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So the ego is a good place to start, maybe the more tangible of the two, if we're going ego and unconscious mind. And ego, uh, um, in the original Freudian work, which is really where it's it's derived, as I talk about it, uh, it was called Dasik uh, in German, which is the I, as in I, I did this, I do this, I do that, you know, I, I think there are four I am. Uh, and so it's you, it's yourself, uh, and reflect on that for a moment. It's that assumption that we have that we are, that I'm Robin and you're Daniel, you know, and, uh, and everything that, that is like gravitationally pulled into that black hole of the self, like this is me, this is my story, this is my experience. And it, it's such a pervasive thing that dominates the way we think yeah, you know, every now and again, sadly, my eyes flit flit to my video, and I'm looking at myself, you know, in a somewhat, you know, scarily narcissistic way, just checking myself. And this is the kind of thing that we do. We're showing a photograph, and sadly, our eyes often go and look at look at us if we're in that photograph, you know, of, of a bunch of people. And so it's a very, you know, it has such a pull, the ego. And, and you'll hear people talk about egoistic ways of thinking, of being. Narcissistic is another one, you know, the sense of everything revolving around you as an individual. Um, that's a kind of pathological sort of extension, although there's a basic narcissism to everyone, like the fact that our eyes, you know, flip to ourselves when we're shown a photo, family photo, say. Um, but... Um, yeah, um, but the ego is 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 pervasive, and and it, it's also a, a a way to kind of organize thought and drive us along. Uh, people have read Michael Pollan's book. He makes some comment in there that ego wrote this book. You know, so that more or less, you know, anything that we do, especially with some drive, is typically kind of ego driven. It's kind of the the car and its engine and its fuel really moving you in a particular direction. Um, and most simply break all of that down, it's the self. I could have said self rather than ego. Um, and then the unconscious is is a slippery, more slippery term um, because it it um, it can be misunderstood. People might think of how you're unconscious where you, you in a boxing match, you get knocked out and then you're unconscious or you go in and have an anesthetic and that knocks you out and then you're unconscious or you fall asleep into deep sleep and you're unconscious that's not really the kind of unconscious that we're referring to in depth psychology it's more the sort of repository or the place in our minds that stores uh the everything in a sense you know 
so much. Um, all our past experiences, uh, everything that we've chosen to try and forget, um, and also, um, you know, anything that we've sort of inherited, you know, images that are deeply human, ancient images, they become encoded in us because they uh, encode, you know, our history, um, uh, stretching back, you know, a long old way. And um, these are human themes, human images, like the monster or the mother archetypes, you know, that's what I'm referring to here. So the unconscious can be both personal, it can be the stuff that you wanted to bury, the stuff that you've just naturally uh, forgotten or never really pulled up into consciousness. Um, or it can be um, uh, uh, more collective, um, where it's about, you know, the human, human nature and, and the human condition, but it's not fully available to conscious awareness. It just comes out when we make a horror film or produce some piece of art, you know. Uh, it's that kind of wellspring of creativity and imagery and iconography. Yeah. Can, can, can trauma, trauma be locked, be locked down, down, down there? And, and, and is, is that, that a, a, one of the reasons why psychedelics uh, have been able to work on people with, with treatment resistance and depression? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, you go through trauma and you want to forget that stuff, you know, naturally. And, and this is a function of the ego that is ego looks after you. You know, there's good reasons, even though we characterize it in, in quite a, a negative way. Often the there's reasons to feel compassionate about the ego. Um, and uh, um uh you, you know it's trying to look after us it, it creates these defense mechanisms repression being trying to forget awful stuff um because it's trying to you know keep us kind of together and so that we can carry on charging forwards um but trauma yeah gets relegated into the unconscious we forget a lot of it then it comes up when maybe we don't want it to in flashbacks or it's coming up and then our defense mechanisms kick in and we dissociate. We're not really there uh, anymore. Um, uh, there's all sorts of different flavors of defense mechanisms, but really that's the domain of the ego. But the unconscious is like the raw truth, if you want. It's the, it's the raw wellspring of, of it all, the, the motion, the memory. That's absolutely. Can you touch upon the default mode network and the mechanisms that uh, you've seen in your studies, both L with LSD and psilocybin, because you, you began with LSD. Is that, is that correct? Uh, we actually started with psilocybin, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, brain imaging studies around 2009, started preparing to do our brain imaging work, 2008, 2009. And then did a couple of fMRI studies with psilocybin where we actually injected it intravenously um, those, are those the images that you see side by side, placebo yeah. and with the right and left brain yeah. hemispheres communicating? That famous, those two circles that you yeah. see and, and love sharing about. Uh, that that was our early fMRI work with psilocybin, and we just share we share our data quite freely and shared it with some mathematical whizzes who generated those analyses and those images. Um, and, and generally the picture, although it's a complicated analysis, is that, you know, the brain is more um, on an activity level. These aren't actual anatomical connections. That's another question that we could ask. And we are. But these are communication pathways. So it's, it's the activity which goes on over time. It's always going up and down, oscillating or fluctuating. And, and just if two regions are going up and down together in synchrony, then you say there's functional connectivity between those regions. What you see in that in those circles is that there's more functional connectivity or synchronous activity across the brain in all the different regions that are around the periphery under psilocybin versus placebo. So that study was something that I looked at last year before I decided to participate 
in a, a, a psilocybin assisted uh, therapeutic um, ceremony. And seeing that study and understanding what happens with concussion and that understanding that some of the areas of my brain were shut down due to trauma, that is that image. And there was an interactive one from the Beckley Foundation that um, it really it really convinced me that this is something that could work for me because I'd tried everything. I'd tried, you know, MOXA acupuncture and self-deprivation tanks and the nutrition and the hormones and um, everything. And, and over the four years, I really didn't get much relief. And so I saw that I was going to a farm to learn about CBD genetics and, and this PhD administered this medicine for me because a, a former teammate knew I'd been, I'd been really struggling. And for me, it, it gave me a chance. It gave me a chance to think differently and it gave me a chance to break out of those destructive thought patterns that I was in. And so number one, thank you, uh, because I, I really do believe that, that seeing that and understanding it really helped me make a decision which ultimately saved my life, which ultimately helped me to break out of those patterns. Um, through your work, and you've done a lot of work, you have over 90 publications I was scanning through yesterday on, on your website, what's the if you could pick one <laughs> i know they're all your babies um or, or a couple what are the most um or what are some of the the studies that really jump out at you that really where you're like wow uh, this could be really really effective for people in in healing their trauma or expanding consciousness or um you know uh, improving that relationship to nature because you you guys have done so many amazing studies mm. Gosh, it's difficult to pick out pick out one because it's been a kind of ride and and it's been, you know, fun all along the way. Really seeing this and that, and even today, I we have a weekly team meeting uh, on Tuesdays, and um, it's so much fun. You know, we have <laughs> someone coming from uh, a researcher in Germany is interested in the overview effect. You know, that's when astronauts. That classically, that's where it's come from. Astronauts go up into space, like the the lunar, um, the the Apollo missions, and then they can look down on the whole of the Earth for the first time, and then they are they have this incredible spiritual epiphany, realization. They see the bigger picture, and so we spent you know half an hour of a hour and a half meeting, kind of deep diving about the the overview effect and. Um, whether it's a you know a fundamental and how you can get to it through different things, but ultimately you have to experience it for the insight to register, you know. And it's a similar thing uh, with 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 psychedelics. I don't know. I'm I, yeah. I guess there's a kind of recency. Is that the right term? Recency bias in that the stuff that's ex you kind of forget your old stuff in a way. It's nice every now and again to be reminded of it and. I mean, those circles, I need to give credit to the uh, Giovanni Petri and Paul Expert who really did that. So um, as is true of all, all our work, it's very much a team effort. And I didn't come up with those circles. You know, it was our collaborators that did it. And then we looked in just like you and, and we're like, wow, that says so much. You know? So, um, But I guess in terms of the recency bias, like stuff that's happening right now, we're looking at data from a, a head to head trial where we compare psilocybin, magic mushrooms, um, to, uh, to a established antidepressant drug called escitalopram. It might be Lexapro in the US, I think. Um, mm. uh, and um, uh, like, it's like Celexa, which is a, just a different older version of it, citalopram. And um, these are like Prozac type drugs. Anyway, people either get six weeks of the Prozac type drug or they get two dosing sessions with the psilocybin. We try and standardize everything. So if you're getting the, the SSRI, the Prozac like drug, you're going to be getting placebo capsules every day and do the dosing sessions with the psilocybin. And so you have to do placebo more or less dosing sessions if people are going into the, um, the Prozac condition, the escitalopram condition. And that's that's kind of dominating my thinking at the moment because it was our flagship study for a while, and the results there are like I was hoping, and I, you know, 
guess, uh, came up with that study because of a few reasons, never really being convinced of SSRIs. Uh, um, uh, I've been immersed in that world, classic psychopharmacology, going to psychopharmacology conferences year, every year solidly for 10 years um, uh, and and just never really being convinced. Uh, and then and then doing our previous depression study with psilocybin, hearing people say, this was so much better than, than the SSRIs, you know. And so I just thought, you know, let's give it a go. Go head to head, see how good this stuff really is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I... I the, I just wish I could tell you more, but the results are just, you know, blown me away. It's got everyone really excited. Um, and so I, I guess that that was whenever you're surprised by your findings, it's a good thing. It either make, means you made a mistake and you really need to make sure that your analyses are right. Or it means you made a mistake in your thinking and your hypotheses were wrong. And there's another newer way of better way of thinking about things. And uh, I think this is going to really wake people up to the therapeutic potential of, of psilocybin, psychedelic plant medicines more generally, because it's put it right next to something that, you know, I don't know how much uh, I could dig it out, the stats, how, however many billions the antidepressant market is worth and, you know, 300 million people i think is it globally depressed and um 350 yeah I yeah. Saw. yeah yeah and so uh you know this is pretty big because uh ssris dominate mental health care um for industrial reasons really because they're cheap and easy mm -hmm. to dish out um and they're kind of safe-ish um uh probably and um <laughs> and, and they work for some people they do but they yeah. they're kind of you know not in a great way just kind of taking the edge off things diluting life in a sense right. and, uh, and so this is i think this is a game changer yeah so that yeah. i think that's where most of my excitement is at the moment awesome i mean i can't wait to see that and it's more so like you said I wouldn't say so much a, a band-aid, but it's more so minimizing the daily symptoms that you're experiencing uh, for the rest of your life every day, rather than getting to the root cause of our, our issues. And I think that's what psilocybin did for me and, and, and woke, woke me up. You know, obviously we talk um, a lot about, and I he you hear a lot about the default mode network, but um, what I want to touch upon is like, so say Daniel a year ago, um, you know, comes across your institution. Obviously, you have a, a, a rigorous vetting process for this and for people that can get into your studies. Um, but can you maybe take us, give us a small picture of what it would look like to be a participant in one of your studies? Uh, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is the, the clinical setting of this work and then the, also the traditional setting um, I've, I've, I've experienced both and, and I have my own opinions about it, but, um, why don't you walk us through quickly about what happens and then maybe touch upon the hidden therapist that you've, you've yeah. liked to touch upon. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I'll try, I'll skip over the boring stuff, which is we have to do a lot of assessment. It's hard to get in the studies and there are certain criteria that you have to meet to get in. But let's say you're you've got in, you know, you've had an assessment, you're enrolled. So we're going to see you for a prep session. We're going to do a deep dive about you, your history. Going to get to know you, uh, build rapport, um, uh, see what um, uh, you know, what are salient, important themes in your life, any trauma that you might have experienced. Uh, um, whether distinct or more complex. Um, and uh, um, um, we'll build a, a relationship of trust, ideally. And, uh, and then we start to prep more in terms of we're thinking about the experience now. Um, what might be a way to approach the experience? And um, 
there we encourage a surrender, uh, an, in, an inquiring mind. Um, and so it's not just entirely passive, it's, it's passive, but uh, we encourage some bravery and a willingness to confront, to ask questions, to work through rather than around any difficulties. Um, and that you're never alone when you do this, you have two guides with you um, who will hold your hand if you want that. Um, and this is to be a very human experience. Nothing is, um, at, you know, n nothing is sort of out of bounds. Everything's fair game. Um, and then that's often done in our recent studies most kind of acutely the day before the dosing session. So your, your mind's really in the right kind of place um, coming into the dosing session. And then you're prepared in the morning, you come into a, a room that's very carefully prepared. The lighting is dim. Um, there's music playing, soft, relaxing, spacious music. And everything is done with a certain mindfulness. Uh, it's slower than usual. It's more present than usual. You don't have the guides looking at their phones. Phones are out of bounds. They're turned <laughs> off. Um, and so there's, a, you know, we encourage it very much a, a presence and an authenticity. And and we looked to our elders, if you want, in terms of how to do this. We were mentored by Bill Richards and the Hopkins team and. Uh, and others and and uh, and their wisdom and we digested it and hopefully tried to emulate it in some way um and and then we have the hidden therapist which is the music yeah uh playing we you know because people we sometimes refer or it's easy to refer to psychedelic psychotherapy at least with in relation to the session as being non-directive and kind of you don't do much it's it uh but you sort of you you sort of do your it's more of a holding presence and a reassurance and uh and then there's the hidden therapist so to say it's non-directive isn't entirely true because people are encouraged to close their eyes they often lie back on a on a bed or a sofa um, and they're encouraged to go inside, to go with the flow, the natural flow of the experience, the imagery that comes up, the emotions that come up, flow with those, explore those. Everything is kind of right, whatever, wherever your mind goes, even if it starts looping into struggle, that's your experience. That's where you stay. You don't try and end that or I don't want that. I wanted a flying into the heavens kind of experience. Um, and uh, yeah, but the music is uh, has an emotional tone and often it catches you like a wave and it takes you along. Sometimes the music can sort of butt against your experience. And, uh, and that's where, you know, if, if the, the way we do it in, in a lab, which isn't a lab, it's a, it's a, you know, pleasant converted, um, clinical room into a soft ceremonial like space but if we think about what might happen in a maloka in um uh in peru with an um, uh, ayahuasca ceremony then you'll have a shaman who's who's um singing to you directly singing into your soul you know and and uh whether it's true or not, uh, you know, being receptive to where you are and then moving you where, 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 you know, where they think you need to go. And it's the song that's working and doing the healing in certain models, at least. Uh, I guess in a, one limitation of our lab, at least to date, or, you know, our experimental scientific way of doing it has been that we haven't been so dynamic the playlist is relatively fixed and we don't change it. Um, and so there's some scope there for improvement. Um, yeah. So that maybe that's one example of, of where it's different to the more traditional setting. We try not to prime people about any metaphysical position. So we don't say you're going to meet God. <laughs> uh, 
uh, we don't frame it in any way like that. We don't say, listen to the mushrooms, they have lessons for you. <laughs> it's more we say, you know, listen to your experience. Right. Um, and you can have all kinds of experiences. Some people report encountering God. Others uh, just have an emotional release, but don't report meeting God. You know, so it's like kind of open, open game in a way. Yeah. I mean, that surrender, I think, is really big because we, as humans, I mean, we love to be in control and, and we need to feel as though we're in control. Uh, in my past life, in my past career, I needed to control everything. I needed to think about every single shift or stride or hit or pass and, and then be hypercritical to myself. And there was this other way of, of living that psychedelic showed me that I could actually let go. And in letting go, instead of holding on tight to these things that I think I'm in control of, they showed me you're just not in control. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it made life a little bit easier to move through. You know, I'm doing a few things. I'm farming. I'm, um, I'm launching a, a new brand. And it's, a, it's really stressful. I have three young kids. And it's, um, it's a lot right now in the, in the time that we're in and, and the, the space that we're in. And so I'm glad that there's, there's a tool for people to be able to utilize because I think it's, it's it's misunderstood and and hopefully this experience uh what the world is going through right now can usher in some uh and your research can usher in some new uh, mental health uh paradigms as we look at them as as we you know as we think about treating mental illness and mental health um and also expanding consciousness because um there's there's a lot of studies out there that that speak to uh, being able to become more creative and being able to um, you know access different types of languages and and art and and things that we didn't know that were there, which I think is is really really exciting. Um, one thing that I think gets a I wouldn't say glossed over uh, but gets missed in all this. There's obviously what you talked about, which is set which is setting your intention for the reason that you'd, you'd like to participate. Setting, which is what you beautifully described. Obviously, dosage is well managed by your team. Um, and, and then there's integration. So <clears throat> can you touch a little bit upon like how you bring somebody back uh, after a ceremony and, and what you do with them in some follow-ups? Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because that, that was a, a, a big – Sort of a mission from what I described is that the experience and the and the process certainly doesn't end with the session, um, and so um, we see people the next day, we see people the next week, we follow people up for longer remotely through you know um, Skype Zoom calls, um, and uh, there it's it's about the learnings really, the lessons uh, that they've received for weeks months afterwards maybe longer um people talk about that they're still processing they're still learning there's still new insights fresh insights that arise almost as if there is a kind of timelessness to those insights like they're not bounded by time in any way um and uh and that that process isn't always easy you know people can go can almost get uh i was gonna say get worse before they get better and, and sometimes it can be like that you know that the um experience has agitated something in their soul if you want you know and um it's lifted the lid um it's um you know lifted a wound if if you want and and the healing is going to take a bit of time and and there there has to be a resolve ideally that you will give it time you will allow it to heal in its in its at its own pace um things don't need to be rushed you know life decisions don't need to be rushed sometimes people are like oh, i just need to leave my husband or whatever you know <laughs> um, and uh I just, nah, yeah, just sit with it. Sit Do with the it. laundry. <laughs> yeah, right. After the ecstasy, the laundry. Yeah, right. 
Uh, I mean, I, and actually, people have said to me previously, oh, I'm interested in psychedelics. What what should I read? And I said, oh, you know, Jack Cornfield after the ecstasy, the laundry. Yeah. Uh, that's a great thing about, I think, psychedelic therapy, psychedelic experiences when they work best is that people realize things that are that go way beyond psychedelics. They are fundamental realizations. Uh, that's when it works best. Doesn't always happen that way, but that's that's when it's healthiest, I think. And there you're just integrating into the natural laws of the universe, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it goes way beyond psychedelics. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was really quite unbelievable. Still, it was about three months after my first experience. Uh, Eleven months ago now. It was June 1, so coming up on a year, and it, I, I drove out to my plants. I'd never planted anything in my life before, and I decided to pop 700 seeds to grow some medicine for my inflammation and, and protect my brain, and, and I looked at these plants, and, and I was like, there's this voice that said, wow, good job, really good job, Dan. That's impressive, and I was like, what the heck? Who, what was that? Because I never positively reinforced anything about myself or, or lifted myself up. It was always this negative self-talk, super hypercritical, again, going back to, to what I learned. And, and it's, I can't explain why, but the gifts kept coming and, and the more realizations kept coming. And the more that I stayed on this this path, obviously I'm human and you stray, but um, with intermittent fasting and changing my diet and staying away from you know, alcohol, refined white sugars, there's certain things that I did to, to, to make sure that that ceremony and the efficacy of, of what happened to me really took hold. And again, it was, it was just absolutely, absolutely life-saving. And I mean, I think everybody knows and my following knows how special this is to me. What, like, why do you think psychedelics are special and, and what do you think, if they're a key per se, what, what can they unlock? Yeah, I, I think they can unlock our minds, um, our souls, if you want. Um, yeah, put it into more kind of jargony. They un unlock our unconscious minds, you know, uh, and uh, and then we become more aware, you know, more aware of ourselves, more aware of how things really are. And it's just amazing that we can um, get caught caught up so much in in what we're doing and uh, what we know and. Uh, you know, pat ourselves on the back about that or, or, or not, you know, beat ourselves up about it, that we should be doing it better. Um, uh, and then, you know, and then when the realizations come, they're really simple and like soft and, um, and, uh, and like, you know, and generous. Uh, <laughs> um, extremely <laughs> like a, like an ideal mother in a way it's like right nurturing yeah yeah nurturing. Yeah, yeah and um and i think that's what it can give us and so you know when you watch uh i don't know the news and you see a political leader stand up and be really defensive about their policy on on uh the on covid19 and it's the it's a problem. It's there. They brought the problem. It's over there, you know. Um, <laughs> who am I talking about? <laughs> um, oh <my> God. <laughs> and then you're just like, oh, poor poor man, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and maybe maybe every everybody in in politics should be should get the right set setting and dosage, you know. Yeah, with the emphasis on the right set and setting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, it definitely does give you this 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 sense or this feeling that that we are all one and that we have to be a little bit more gentle to ourselves. You know, yeah. I think that's why my narrative changed, you know, without me really realizing it. It's just it, it's time to be 
it's t- easy does it. It's time to be a little bit more gentle. And even with everything that I have going on, I find myself in these days. And if people out there are listening and you find yourself in like this rumination of thought and you find yourself getting edgy, uh, even like with your kids or with your wife, <clears throat> because you think that you're here, but you should be over here and you should be further down the road with certain things. It's these expectations of myself that I've kind of, I've been able to let go. Yeah. And again, and it goes back to that letting go, yeah. you know, um, and then I'm able to operate off of intuition. And it's been, it's, it's been really amazing how much my life has changed in such a short amount of time. And, and I, I know I've, I've listened to, and we're going to attach a bunch of these links, uh, lifting the veil, your YouTube talk, um, at Ted, uh, Warwick was it? Um, back in, yeah, 2016 was just really amazing, and and you're ushering in a new time, uh, and and this amazing science. I love that science is leading the way. And uh, is there anything um, that you're doing in the way of? I thought I heard some whispers of it. Doing studies about the what you see in a clinical setting as opposed to what you see in a quote unquote traditional setting, whether it be ayahuasca or whether it be psilocybin. Yeah. Yeah. And again, these are my colleagues really. And, and they're, they're, they're so good because they don't need to be directed. They go away, you know, they share the, the, the passion that we all have and, and they come up with their own ideas. And, and so they, they've been looking into ceremonies using this, survey tool that we have psychedelicsurvey.com and we have a particular study uh, ceremony sur- survey or ceremony study i think dot com and uh it's a really useful platform for collecting it's tracking really people ahead of time and then through the process of the ceremony but what we've been picking up which is really exciting is that there can be a um there can be a group experience that's perceived um, that goes beyond the individual experience and certain things can predict having this perceived group experience and I hope we're still online the, the picture just dropped away um, it could be tied in with changes in your belief systems um, um, changes in your metaphysical beliefs that, that you know the mind and body relationship um uh and um so that's that's a really important message because it's sort of you know it it's basically saying there's a lot of power that's kind of conferred over to a group and then you know an individual who might be leading the group as in their their views can sort of um translate and transmit over to the group and certain people are more susceptible uh uh to this so basically i, I guess a lot that's coming from that work that's that's new for us, even though it it sort of hits you know lands with intuition anyway. But it, and a lot of science is sort of getting getting doing something systematically to really demonstrate it well. And often our assumptions are wrong as well. You know, intuitions can be can be wrong, often right, but often wrong. Right. Um, and so you got to, you do have to test them. And, and so I, there's a really important lesson there. It's, it's basically saying, you know, there's huge sort of power and responsibility on those doing group work um, and leading groups. And, um, and we've also actually, there's some hints that the, the group experience can actually be additive and whether or not that's because big doses are used in groups, we'll need to control for that kind of thing. Um, but there may well be something about the relational nature of group experiences. It's not just you in relation to your mm. unconscious. It's you in relation to the others in the group and then the uh, group sharing that's done afterwards and the relationship to the person leading the group. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, there's there's some good stuff there, I think. Yeah, you, you describing Peru and ayahuasca, and that's how we connected myself, uh, yourself, Hans, yeah. and, and Keith. And yeah. I just want to give Keith a shout out. Yeah. He just launched Heroic Hearts UK. 
So heroicarts.com UK, and we'll put it down in the link, but please go and check them out. And, and he's a guy doing some really amazing work. He is working with uh, Jesse Gould of the Heroic Hearts Project here over in the United States. And back in January, I actually went to an ayahuasca retreat, went to Peru with, uh, with a former teammate, uh, uh, an executive, and then two veterans. And what we did was subsidize the treatment for the veterans and we had this amazing all of us had that warrior mentality that warrior spirit and we had this really collective life-changing amazing experience and to your point chris at la medicina in terrapoto peru like sang to me sang through me uh helped work the medicine through me and and again some really amazing realizations about not being afraid of the unknown and death and that's that was my intention and and <clears throat> there was some really amazing work done so in going back i was just so blown away it's like well how how do i give back and so then um it was an opportunity to be able to meet keith and, and possibly do one of these studies that you're talking about or surveys at a retreat which i know will happen in the future once the world opens back up again which i'm really really excited for uh, obviously there's no brain imaging there with these surveys, you're just asking questions. Are you doing any gut biome? Is there any anything like that coming? Um, gut biome stuff. Uh, there might be some like saliva samples where we can look at um, hormones and such like. Um, uh, but um, we can also stick, you know, easy to use uh, EEG caps on, which record brain oscillations, brain waves. Right. So we can look in in the brain in that way. But for the most part, it's just what we call psychometric, psychological measures. Um, and the ideal is that we cut down the number of measures because we've got too many. Right. And, um, uh, you know, we don't want it to be an arduous process for people. And actually, we really want to give back. And, and that's part of our thinking at the moment is like, how can we give people information back when they do this? At the moment, they just do it off their own back. They're, they're not reimbursed at all. I mean, we do try and express the sentiment. If you're going to be doing these experiences that could save your life and turn your life around, then kind of make it count. I know it counts for you. Right. Make it count for the world by registering it as data. And, and we've got a platform for doing that. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, if we can set it up so that we can make it more fun, and people get information back, like data visualization, um, cool charts, essentially, that tell them stuff. Right. And I think that that's going to make it worth it for them. And ultimately, in time, you know, the reason why we collect data is it tells us what works and what doesn't and how things can work better uh, and for what, you know. So it addresses a lot of questions that can help improve the delivery um, of 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 the treatment and that's great to hear i mean i the reason that i love that imagery that i saw is because it, it just helped me connect everything like wow so i go to these concussion clinics and they tell me to stimulate the different regions of my brain that are shut down due to trauma and i looked at those those that connectivity i'm like wow i think i think this can do something especially with um psilocybin specifically uh, working heavily in the in the prefrontal cortex, I think is is where most of our damage is for athletes uh, that are at risk for CT with the repetitive head trauma. Um, and I know I asked you and Hans about the TBI studies um, and if any are coming out. But um, you know, maybe that's a, a, another discussion for another day. I know that you're you're a busy man, and I really do appreciate you taking this time to to speak to my following and. And if <clears throat> if anybody has any other questions, um, and, and like I said, I'm going to put a bunch of the links down um, on the YouTube page. Where can they where can they find you? I know you're on Twitter. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm a bit hooked on Twitter <laughs> more than I should. <laughs> the um, rabbit, the rabbit hole. Yeah, it is. yeah, I've fallen down, and uh, so I, they can find me on Twitter. You know. Um, uh, that's probably the best way to do it. And then we've got a website. I, uh, I can't reel it off off the top of my head, but put Incentive for Psychedelic Research, Imperial, 
and it'll pop up. We've got a really nice video on there, which tells the world what we're about. Um, Psychedelicsurvey.com is great for us because um, it, it feeds our science and allows us to collect big data. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, yeah, Twitter's a good place to find me. <laughs> nice, and we'll provide that link down below. Um, if anybody feels inclined to be able to um, want to get involved with some of this research and some of this work, I encourage you to do that. And if there's if there's anybody out there that uh, wants to get um, in touch with Robin, I just DM'd him on, on Twitter. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a good way to to get a hold of you. And and I hope that um, you you just had a, a young boy. Is that right? Uh, yeah, little Remy. Nice. I yeah. love the name, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. And yeah, thank you so much again for doing this. And and um, I hope that everybody got a lot out of it. And and hopefully we'll be able to circle circle the uh, the wagon here in a in a few months or <clears throat> and and just revisit this. And and uh, I can't wait to to hear about the SSRI study and see that data. So just uh, really excited, man. And and thank you so much again, Robin. That's been my pleasure. Thanks, Daniel. All right, brother. All the best to you. You too, man.